All right, so let's get on with the with the chapters. Okay, let me. So basically, I did join. Um, let me share my screen. Um, uh, first, let me open the book. Where is the book? Let's be here. Give me one second. Yeah. Okay, and let me share my screen. Has any any of you um, managed to join the Sunday uh, lesson? No, actually. Okay. I, I was there for part of it, but I didn't stay very long. Okay, I, I was there, luckily there, the whole time. So, we were supposed to finish uh, all the way up to callbacks, but we didn't. Um, it, it's quite interesting to work with them. Sometimes different discussion comes along. So I think building complex model functional. This is this was done. This was done. This was done here. So we in that class we left in here, just saving a model and driving it back. So we didn't do the callbacks in that lecture. So maybe we, we start from here today and then we'll try to finish it up. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Yeah, so we, we probably um, take, let's say, 45 minutes. Uh, we meet at 10 to seven. Yeah. 10 to seven, we get together and then we'll go through it quickly. Okay. For half an hour. Thank you. Great, All right. Thanks. Okay. I'll talk to you then in 45 minutes.
Hello, Just thinking, like if I'm not, shall we start? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's get started. Right, you can see my screen, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And can you see the screen when I when I'm moving um, my screen? Like, now, can you see now? We're still looking at the book. It's the same. Yeah, it's the same thing. Too. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing and then start sharing again. So I think I'm sharing only one screen. I like to screen the uh, share the the whole desktop. So it's getting a little bit hectic here uh, as the Zoom getting hiding behind the scene. So I need to find where it is. Bear with me for one second. Okay, I can't seem to follow it. It's here. Okay, stop share. Strange. Oh, let's talk to here. Okay. And here we go. Okay, so let's get started. Actually, I, I, I just wanted to flip back between the, um, the screen uh, for a tensor board, so I thought just to fix that beforehand. All right, so let's start with the callback. So basically, what he's saying here is that when we when we run the um, our uh, model, we just have one method that's just a fit. But he is saying that you can have the uh, sort of um, uh, hooks, or like if you want to extract some information or push some information between the training. So between the batch or starting of a training, ending of a training or starting of an epoch or ending of an epoch, so on and so forth. You can, you can use the method called a callback to, uh, to, uh, to interrupt a model or to check uh, the status or perhaps uh, you, can, you can save um, the the intermediate result as well, so that's that's what he is uh, talking about here, which is callbacks. That's okay. callbacks. So um, and here he is defining a callback uh, with the uh, with the skiras dot callback dot model checkpoints. We, he's just calling it as my Kira's model H five. What it's going to do is if we pass that checkpoint here, when we fit the model, what it's going to do is it's going to um, it's going to save the model uh, um, in between um, when, when it's training. Uh, that's that's the uh, checkpoint callback. And um, 
moving on to the next point so here he again this is what he's uh, uh, he's saying again uh, is the same thing um and then um i think somewhere here he's he's talking about uh, uh you can you can you can um you can mention a call back call back to have your to have your uh, model running for epoch let's say whatever epochs you want to do, give however you can um, you, you need to stop your training when your validation uh, validation score start going um, up so that's that's the point where i think you have you, you get the optimal position and so how do you know it you can you can do through a callback so what you can do is you can call back this call back called uh, early stopping and then you can mention patience is equal to 10 means that you can let your model know that keep running and if the validation score doesn't uh, improve in 10 epochs then you can stop and then give the give me the best model during that point around uh, point around so that's that's early stopping callback is defining here and all we need to do is to have passed this callback here um, as an early stop, uh, stopping callback. So what we are doing is doing the fit method. We are passing our X train, Y train, and then our validation data. We are saying run it for a hundred epoch, or we can say thousand epoch. However, we are passing the callbacks. Two callbacks we are passing. One is a checkpoint callback. So the checkpoint callback is going to save your model after um, after I'm not sure any idea when does it save uh, it may be after each epoch I guess uh, saves the checkpoint of your model at a regular intervals during training so um, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, at what time it saves. So let's assume at the moment every epoch is going to save your uh, model and plus, and it's going to have an early stopping. That means if your model gets the optimal position at around, let's say 80 epochs, and it's gonna keep going up to 10 more, uh, but if it doesn't improve around 90, so it's gonna just stop and then give you that uh, model uh, optimization around like minus 10 um, epoch whatsoever. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we are here again. I think this is what I was trying to do. What he's doing is after every epoch, he defined a me the method on epoch and every after every epoch, he wants to print out validation versus training losses is all he is doing is just uh, 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 printing it uh, wrapped around a class and then a class is inherited from Akira's callback class and uh, I think I have done something let me show you here I was doing something here um, if you run this yeah so what I have done here is is this the one uh, it is this epoch, not this one. Yeah. I did print and that. So this is checkpoint. Here. So what he is doing here is uh, all he, he has done is callback is equal to your own callback, which you defined up here. So we we just created the object of that type of this this uh, this class uh, here, and we passed it to a method uh, fit. So what we are saying here is that for every after every epoch print just the uh, validation by training and then you can see after every epoch mm -hmm. it's it's printing uh, the validation over uh, training loss for us so in a sense what he's saying here is 
you can write uh, your own custom program uh, beginning on train before the training or after the training or perhaps ever, uh, on before and or after each epoch or maybe a bit in the batch so you, you you have that flexibility and i think um in a fast ai the uh, uh, second leg of fast ai last year jerby went back quite a lot about the callback and um the reason for him going from the version 1 to version 2 is a lot about these um callbacks so he he mentioned that he he rewrote the whole library just to incorporate more callbacks so uh, he's a big fan of it anyway so these are the different methods of light for the training side as well as on the test side you have a same method like you can before before a batch or end of a batch or perhaps on a uh prediction side you you can you have these methods whatever suits you you can call these methods and write your personalized code to get this uh, this done so these are the callbacks and 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 this 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 all about callbacks any anything you want to share about the callbacks um i i think it's obvious for me but uh, just to confirm these uh, these on epop train even though they look like they're functions that you have named yourself they're actually some specific thing they're from something are they uh, i think they are a uh, part of the library so it, okay. it's uh, i think you you need to define those you need to define these functions what you want to do but it provides you the library provides you that capability of you can insert those those function either before or after um, mm. after the uh, training if yeah. i yeah so because we it, the keras is supporting callbacks so what does it mean is that the library has the capability where it it provides you the opportunity to insert sorry about that uh, insert your code wherever you want through the callbacks now where you want to insert your code these are the different uh places where you can search your code and or if, perhaps you want to get the information at that stage yeah but if you see like nothing you yeah, like where you define on epoc and nothing inside the code is suggesting that it is at epoc end right so like there must be something about the name on epoc end that is like cuz usually like when you yeah, oh mm you know you know what i mean like it it must be yeah. there must be like something in yeah. keras or fit or something that's like okay here's or maybe in model compile actually yes i think i i know what you're saying what you're saying is um that so this method has been defined for you already somewhere yeah there entity. must be like a self equal you know maybe something like yeah, yeah. is it makes so sense yes these uh, function names are standard then does that mean so like you have to call it on epoch and and then add your parameters so to... yeah i guess so uh okay yeah i'm not sure i mean yeah it, it seems you know cuz like usually when you define stuff it, yeah it's yeah maybe also why like it's a class and then you define the function like maybe this uh print val train ratio callback like keras dot callbacks mm. maybe yeah it's yeah. like something that already exists and yeah maybe yeah we're just changing like some parameters maybe mm. oh so how did you implement this uh dinesh did you say you have that in your notebook somewhere like yeah so well like i i just um, so basically what i have done well like it's it's not uh, i have done it it's the can natural ah uh, yeah yeah okay cool cool just ran it so what he has done is uh, he wrote a new class mm -hmm. uh, inherited from a callback and it says on epoch end yeah and it's now yeah, yeah. it's just gone so we, we just we just pass that callback Mm. So if so I think we probably three of us got the idea that what we have done is we have implemented is yeah. on epoch end 
we can go ahead and then say uh, another there is another method let's say um, uh, whatever it, it's saying so it it said here on epoch uh, this yeah. on epoch end so let's say we call it as on epoch begin yeah uh, and so they stay same. So they, I think I think these functions are well defined. Yeah. And we say here, blah, you know, whatever we want to do. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's uh, left for us to implement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, these methods are given, and I think there is a way. Uh, again, I, I I don't know. Other than these methods. Again, this is like Jeremy who has a way of doing more refinement. What refinement? Don't ask me because I have seen him say, oh, these are the standard methods which you can apply. But he figured through something called hooks so that he can go a one step further. But that that's beyond me to have that understanding as of yet. But I think he has a good way of uh, refining his fast AI library. So we will come we will come to that at some stage. I guess. Mm, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Okay, so and the next thing now, he uh, with the TensorFlow is our TensorFlow uh, TensorBoard, and then TensorBoard is nothing but whatever we are doing here, all these um, validation losses or training losses which we are seeing here, they 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 we can, we can visualize this way. So it's like a graphical representation of our training and validation loss. And then we can see how that curve get drawn whatsoever. So that's that's in a nutshell, which I understood. And, and what he's saying here is you need to, it comes by default with the Kiras. And all you need to do is um, obviously every time you run, it, it gathers some files. So let me go back here and show you first and then we can discuss. So if you see here, um, it's today, today's date and it's the time as well. So, and it creates two files for every run, train, and one is train and another is validation. Okay, so these, these two files for every run get created. And then what he's saying is, um, the best way of doing is you create a subdirectory wherever you are, and within a subdirectory, you need to have another subdirectory, which kind of like for every time you run, it creates a subdirectory for you. So let's say if you're running a program 10 times, like I, I have been doing here, like training once, and then in the afterwards I'm training again. So if you keep on training, you don't want to mix up the files. And then let me show you the files. I, would, I have been looking at the files. Um, if I can find... Uh, just give me one second. Okay. So here. So um hands on machine learning and hands on and my logs. So if you look here, I have run it three times and every time it created a folder. Within a folder, it's create train and validation folders again. And within, within these folders, we have these um, files get created, which actually um, collect the logs uh, of each run. So these are the file has the logs and which will eventually draw uh, these graphs for us. Uh, this, this, these graphs. So the, these are the folders, and this is the file within it. And then these files are actually creating these graphs for us. So that's what he's talking about here. So this function is nothing but just creating that uh, subdirectory for you. That's what he's talking about here. And again, um, uh, to Activate it. You need to uh, you need to send this another callback. Uh, I'm not sure why it's keep on adding this. 
I'm sorry about that. Every time I click on something, it just go off and then try to find it. Uh, I'm just trying to highlight. And um, okay, so for a tensor board, all you do is call back tensor board CB. And what's that done? In your directory structure, these are the file gets created, and uh, you can activate. All you need to do is once you have gone there, you need to um, activate it by this command tensorboard this guy here. So once you activate, the tensorboard will come automatically on your screen. So let me show you. Go back here. Here. So. Uh, so this is my local host here. And where is the tensor gone? Sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry. So local host, the port number is 6006. And that's that's that, that's exactly what he's going to show you. And now here you can compare between uh, training part one, and then you made some changes, and then you ran it again, and then training part two, or perhaps you can compare between the training and the validation, how the uh, the curves are going. There is something wrong with my graph at the moment. I still need to figure it out. My validation is just flat. Uh, and then a test is, uh, the training is uh, going smooth. Um, however, in the book, we'll go back to here. So how did you uh, tell it to, so like, what did you pass to do that? Was okay, yeah. So all you do is when you call, you say model dot fit, and then you have a callback oh, as yeah. a tensor. So that's what all you need to do. And then you define that callback like this. I'm not going to double click it. Every time I double click something else pops up. So, and obviously where that those files are going to store, these files you yeah. define through this function, which, have, which we have defined here. Mm -hmm. And which is nothing but in a current directory, it will create a subdirectory with the date and a timestamp so that every time you have a run, you have a new subdirectory. And every time you have a new subdirectory, those events are um, time bound. And then it, it's clean to see here. If you see here, it's quite clean. He's, he has clicked on one run, another run, and he can see, oh, that was my first run. I went back and then I tweaked a few things and then ran it again and it, it has decreased so that I, I got some improvements so on and so forth. So this is this is TensorFlow. So when Make, you do that, does it like, you know, this uh, visualizer, does it like come up in a different screen or, or in yeah. the... So what you do is, let me do it. Uh, mm, yeah, if you don't okay. mind. So what, what I have done is, Obviously, actually, you can do on the on the screen as well. Okay. So in the screen, you have two commands. Um, uh, up here, yeah. So you need to give these two commands. Okay. Mm -hmm. So once you have called the fit method, after the fit method, you can load the the tensor board within your uh, workbook here, or you can, if you want the separate one, let me drag this guy here. All I have done here is in the in my directory, you can give this command. If you see this highlighted, mm -hmm. one, yeah. so that is to start the tensor board. Uh, board okay? okay. And once it has started, you need to go into this uh, location. So in this location, the tensor board will present you. And this location is nothing but here. Yeah, cool. No, that's yes. cool. Thank you. Yeah. There's a question. Do, are you running it? So is your notebook local or are you running it with like any of the cloud services? Uh? No. So TensorBoard comes default with your um, installation. I, I have installed on my laptop and okay. it comes by default. All you need to do is activate that environment and that's that's available for you. However, what you need to do is um, obviously, you need to uh, call it with a callback. Yeah, uh, that I mentioned yeah. here. You call it. Once you have done the callback, you need to start it here like this. Either you can start uh, on the on the prompt like I have done here, or mm -hmm. if you don't want to do, you can call it in your uh, notebook as well. So, like, 
a notebook. Here, so you can call it on a notebook. All you need to do is you just mention the same command here. So you say percentage load extension tensor board. So this is like your magic command. And uh, this command, either you give it on the on the local drive or in the in the notebook. If you give it on a notebook, it's going to load in here for you. Okay, thank you. I'm just asking because I'm using the Google Colab, and so like I can't. But just in case I want to use it on locally on my laptop, I was just uh, yeah. So I think that. Yeah. Google Colab, you need to use this. Yeah, yeah, I think they won't allow you to go from the back end. So you can do this, but on a local, as obvious, you, you need to go in here. Great, thanks. All right, okay. Th that's pretty much it. I think I haven't played with the tensor board itself. Uh, obviously, we need to play a little bit more. I was just looking at here graphs. It does provide some information here. Uh, uh, what the dense layers are, and I'm assuming if we go further on, it will provide more information. Again, I haven't looked into great detail, but uh, once it gets started, I think you, you have a quite a good uh, information going inside the training process, which could be quite um, intriguing to see what exactly he is doing, so and so forth. So I'll, I'll leave this uh, for the exploration for you guys to do. Let's move on. We are running out of time. Okay. So that was TensorBoard. Uh, I haven't done this. So what he's mentioning here is actually, he mentioned that you can have uh, images, you can have uh, loads of processing which you're doing. They all can come within the TensorBoard. So let me find out where he has mentioned. I haven't done his, he said you should try this, but let me go where he's saying. Uh, somewhere he's mentioned, oh yeah, yeah. So what he said is um, it used this writer to construct log scalar. So scalar, histograms, image, audio, text, and all which can then be visualized using a tensorable. So what he's saying is within the program, if you're using the image or audio or a text or a histograms, you can throw into the log files and then you can utilize, um, utilize within the tensor board uh, to see or you, if you want to do the intermediate results. I haven't done this guy yet, so um, I, I'll probably be doing afterwards, but that, that was interesting. So it's, it's not only just to looking at these two curves, I guess what he's trying to give us an idea that um, between each epoch or between each batch job, what's going on, we can, we can further visualize. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Um, now he mentioned, now here, here he comes as a, like a fine tuning in neural networks and hyperparameters. So as we know already that, um, in a neural network, we all we need to do most of the work is to find out the best uh, set of the hyperparameter, whether it's the learning rate or number of neurons, number of layers, so on and so forth. So this is where he's talking about here. And interestingly, um, later on it will come. What he mentioned here is like you can use the grid search, um, grid search or randomized search. Uh, and he, he recommend using a randomized search beforehand and then find out the best, not a best parameter, some idea of a parameter space, which gives you some idea where the optimized results lie. And then he say, then you can further explore on. Um, however, how we, we go about for, uh, for the, um, for the, um, uh, hyperparameter tuning, he mentioned that we need to, we, we just define a, a function where we have a default parameters here. And within that function, we define the sequential KP, uh, uh, KPI. And then what, what we're doing here is we just defining the different layers. Within the layer, this N underscore neurons, which is coming as in a part of the parameter. Uh, 
uh, for the function. Um, if not passed, it's default. If it passed, then we'll use that. And that's, that's what he's trying to, um, trying to uh, demonstrate here. For example, learning rate is equal to learning rate. So that means it's not defined here constant. When we call this uh, function, we'll pass that parameter or we may not pass default parameter come into a, uh, come into a picture. So all, all we are doing here is just to define a function. The function will define the different layers based on whatever value we pass. And once we pass uh, that function um, will become a, a model, we have to wrap it around this Kira's regressor uh, um, a library. So he says it's just a thin, uh, it's a thin wrapper, which will make this build model function as a regressor. And when we call it as like a fit method, now here we're going to specify where, so, okay. So we, we are not specifying any parameter here. So what does it mean is, is going to take these default parameters. However, at later stage, he did specify here. Yeah. So now, am I clear up to this point? Am I making sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So now what he's saying is because now we have built the, 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 this is a functional KPI, uh, sorry, functional um, uh, layers or API, uh, which he defined uh, initially. And what we're going to do is we're going to have this um, parameter distribution, which is we are doing a randomized search where number of hidden layers could be zero, one, two, three, number of neurons can go from one to hundred and learning rate go from 3e minus four to 3e minus two. Um, and these are the value get passed. And then obviously we are want to run the randomized search for K fold, uh, K, uh, CV of uh, three and number of times, 10 times we want to run it. So this is going to find out the optimized um, these uh, hyperparameters for us. The parameters can be, once it's complete, the uh, random search, we can find out the parameters from best underscore parameters. So learning rate came this, hidden parameters came two, and n neurons come 42 as a you know, uh, number of nodes we require. And then the best score this random search achieved was point minus 0 0.31 and so on and so forth. And then, uh, th this we have done, I think, in chapter two um, already. Now, um, this is the point which I was trying to make. Like he said, the first run a quick random search using a wide range of hyperparameter values and then run another search using a smaller ranges of values centered on the best one to find during uh, first run and so on. So what, what he's trying to say is hyperparameter tuning is actually a uh, quite a quite an area of work. Um, basically, all you need to do is with the random, um, with this random search CV, these parameters may or may not be the optimal. However, what he's trying uh, to say is that sorry. this is the area. Yeah, I just have a quick question about these. Uh, so the best parameters that were for me and the best score too, but did you run the best estimator? Like, did it work for you? Because for I me, you gave me an I haven't, I haven't run it. So okay. from yeah, this, know. basically what he's trying to say, uh, the reason I had highlighted it, the best parameters, they may or may not be the best, but that gives you the area where you can focus on. Now, if you look at the next point he's making here is, that he says you can that area you need to further zoom in. Uh, th there is a possibility that uh, within those parameters you can further run your um, hyperparameters tuning. You can do further tuning to find the best estimators. That's what he's saying here. And again, um, there are different libraries like these guys. All of them are 
are in this area working to find out the what are the best uh, hyperparameters are. Yeah, I'm probably using like a slightly older version. So maybe they have like, maybe the function is called something else now. I need to check. I was just- uh, Yeah, I haven't, I I haven't run, so I'll, I'll, I'll be running yeah. it to see. Yeah, yeah. I, I usually, I usually just stop here and then just move on. But uh, I guess once you start going into a deep, uh, then probably you need to do a little bit more research. And mm. interestingly, um, now that's that's what he was saying. The hyperparameter tuning is actually the very uh, active area of work. And then if you have heard uh, one thing, which I want to mention is like a Google has a auto ML. You you probably have you guys probably have heard auto ML is the kind of like a buzzword in the in the um, uh, machine learning industry where like has to go or a data dog all they do is just you can throw your data into these tools which run like 20 30 different models and then comes back with the um with the high accuracy or whatever um loss function you're looking and then you can further throw into another tool which uh again come back with the uh, with the best parameters for you um, so and so, so like they 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 are talking about uh, Google provide is auto ML, which I like to explore further. But again, rest in the rest rest of the paragraph. This is what he's saying. There are different paper came in to see um, what are the best way of going about it. Okay, so um, any question or anything we want to discuss? Okay, um, next he talked about number of hidden layers and interestingly, um, he mentioned, uh, just a quick question. Have you guys uh, gone through the um, playground? Uh, I'm talking about this guy. And... Have you guys gone through this? I, I looked through it. Um, oh, I, I did uh, look briefly last week, uh, but I didn't yeah. uh, play around much. Yeah, the um, I think you should look into this a little bit more. Very interesting to when you start observing. And the reason I'm bringing it up, what he said around here, <laughs> He's saying that um, most of the problems you can solve with just one layer. And th this will prove you here, like you have just one layer, let's say one layer. When you go with the, uh, this, uh, this data set or this data set, you'll find one layer is good enough. But when we start going into, let's say this data set, which is quite complex, it doesn't matter how many layers, how many neurons you add in, um, it's still struggle and then you slowly add uh, another layer, it will try to do something, but more layers you add, shallow layers, quickly it converts. But if you go down with adding more and more um, neurons, it still doesn't work for a complex uh, data. And that's exactly what he's talking about in here, number of hidden layer. He said the most of, I wouldn't put the number, but most of the problem you can solve with just throwing a number of neurons in a one layer only. However, when the complex problem comes in, uh, it's better to throw more uh, layer than the neuron. And it, one of the takeaway which I got from here is, um, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this. Okay, yeah. So this is number of neuron per hidden layer. What he mentioned here uh, is like, uh, if you have seen like uh, when we started this, we, for a first dense layer, we had a 300, then we have a 200 and you can have 100. He's saying initially people thought if you have a multiple layers, you can have uh, these, you can have 
more neurons, less neurons, less and less. Now he said, like, you don't need to bother about it. You just go same. Uh, let's say a four here, four here, four here, equal amount. You can go with this. And most of the time, that will solve a problem. Uh, so it's not like we need to find a very complex combination of different neurons on a different layers, so on and so forth. Uh, all he's saying is you can keep the same. It's going to work good enough in a most of the problems. And um, most of the times, if the, the data is complex, add more layers. That's the gist of what he's trying to say in here, uh, which I got it from here. It's interesting what he said here. Uh, I'm going to go back to here. Like This is what he's saying. Why do you need a more, uh, uh, more layer? And uh, interestingly, he said, like a long time, people thought that uh, the one layer can capture all the intricacies of the problems. So they didn't go very deep. But uh, the reason you need to go deep is because um, different layers can learn a different, um, uh, different aspect of your data. And that's the, the good example he gave is, um, uh, uh, this is the paper by Fungus and Zeiler. And what, the, uh, what they showed is that different layers of a neural network learn a different aspect. So for example, layer one is kind of learning a bit of a pattern. So this, this is actual pattern and it's learning a little bit of uh, about general uh, pattern. And then in a layer two is kind of learning the edges uh, or the circles. Three is trying to learn more about the object in here. As we go layer by layer, layer it is actually learning a more detail about the object itself. So the point being, a uh, very uh, interestingly, he said the these are the general aspect for for the layers. So like th these could be like a common behavior between a different uh, different objects, so on and so forth. So another point he made in here is that's the reason, first of all, you need um, a deep layer because different layers learn a different aspect. Lower layers will learn about the general behavior of an object and upper layer will uh, combine together whatever is in a lower layer and uh, uh, recognize the object whatsoever. So the point being that the lower layer are very generalized. Whatever they learn about the one object, it can be transferred to the another object. And that's what the transfer learning is. And transfer learning is nothing but, I'm going to go back here, that you take whatever your, uh, whatever your network has learned in the lower layer, let's say layer one, layer one, layer two, layer three, and then you can just utilize it for your object these four layers holds true, have learned some patterns about the image or they are using in NLP as well. So it has learned about, about the object which you are training. And then all you need to do is just train the last layer which, can, which learns the domain specific idea. And that's what he's talking about here in a transfer learning. I hope I am making sense here. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Okay, um, I, I talked about the hidden layer. Um, and again, this, this is what I was talking about here, like the, the auto ML. Uh, he has Google auto ML, I think in chapter 19. Um, and then we are going to learn a lot more about the hyperparameter, like the learning rate, the batch size. Batch size, one thing, batch size, I think there is a funny quote. Um, Friends don't let uh, friends don't let friends use mini batch larger than thirty two, um, and I, I think one of the paper I read that most of the time you can get away with the batch size of a thirty two, and I think this is uh, this is something to do with the batch normalization as well. Uh, I, I read somewhere so this seems to be thirty two seems to be standard. However, there are obviously. It's not 100% for every single problem. There are like few people have get the very good result with the 
that uh, the, that bigger of a size of a batch. However, in general, it's recommended to use a smaller batch size for um, whatever reason. And uh, yeah, learning rate, uh, about the learning rate, um, again, there is uh, one paper by uh, Leslie Smith, I think I would, he mentioned somewhere here, yeah. So I think uh, if you haven't looked at this paper, you should look at this paper. Uh, he's talking about learning rate, uh, learning. So what, what's the best learning rate you can come up with? So I guess this paper, um, everybody should uh, read. Uh, Jeremy is quite a big, um, uh, quite a big, uh, sorry. He, he, he's a big fan of this guy, uh, Leslie Smith. And going back learning rate batch of the uh, best size and other hyper words i guess they're going to come further on in chapter 11 and so on and so forth that's pretty much it from my side i think i'll be over a bit so anything you guys want to discuss no i think well for me it's okay uh, made sense thank you yeah yeah, it made sense. Thank you. Okay, yeah. You're welcome. Um, so you guys, uh, I think Wan Cheng is doing the um, homework afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Take care, and then I'll see you on a Monday, on a Sunday class then, chapter eleven. <laughs>